I want you to note that I was a, I was sitting here because there's not very often has that been the case. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hello everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started now. Our speakers will take their places. <coughs> so, the first panel, thanks to the insights of Kevin, Roy, and Matt was basically a view from the trenches. And we got a very, very personal perspective of uh, both the background and the processes of peace in Northern Ireland. In this panel, we're going to see an examination of the peace process from more of an academic and outsider's perspective. Although I should say that everybody on this panel, including the moderator, have spent quite a bit of time in Ireland. Um, as for me, uh, when I used to teach in Boston, I ran a summer abroad program in Galway. And I did this for seven years, spending each summer in Ireland. And after my classes were over at 11, I would take my students up to Northern Ireland. We'd go through Derry, uh, and we would go up to uh, the Giant's Causeway. Um, we would go through Belfast and sometimes take the ferry across to Scotland. Um, so those are my old stomping grounds as well. Let me tell you about the speakers on this panel. Uh, first, we're going to have Byron Bland, who is um, an associate director of the Stanford Center on Conflict and Negotiation at Stanford University. He has served on the Stanford campus for 18 years as a chaplain, and he left that post in 1994 to concentrate on peacemaking efforts in Northern Ireland. Uh, in, in addition to engrossing himself in those processes, for the past 20 years, he's taught an interdisciplinary course on peace at Stanford. And from that perspective, he is going to give us his insights. Uh, next, we're going to have Bonnie Weir, who we've introduced already, but she, again, gets the credit for having this idea, um, knowing these people, and really putting this all together. And finally, we have Brandon O'Leary, who's the director of the Pennsylvania Program in Ethnic Conflict at the University of Pennsylvania. He was actually born in Cork, Ireland, um, although he has been all over the world, being brought up in Nigeria, Sudan, and Northern Ireland. He uh, graduated from Oxford University. His PhD was from London School of Economics. And then it was later uh, after winning the Robert McKenzie Memorial Prize, which if you don't know is the primo prize um, in in this area, uh, his PhD was published as a book by Oxford University Press. Um, he has done so many books, both in this area and in the area of uh, peace negotiations and conflict resolution, 19 books, 125 articles. Um, his latest book is How to Get Out of Iraq with Integrity, and people have said that it is, it is the blueprint that the Obama administration has been using. So we're very happy to have you with us today as well. Uh, without further ado, I turn it over to the panelists. They will each speak for 20 minutes. We will have time for about 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A. Then all the panelists will assemble together, and we'll have a 15-minute final wrap-up uh, without a break in between. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin with the kind of customary thanks to uh, Michael and Bonnie and Calvin and everyone for making this possible. Uh, it's not only customary kind of remarks, they're deeply felt ones. I had uh, felt quite privileged to be a part of the conversations last night and to be a part of this group. But I also want to begin uh, by expressing my deep respect I have for the first panel and many people like people on the first panel. Uh, I do believe that the real peacemakers in Northern Ireland were not the politicians. Uh, they weren't John Hume and David Trimble. They were folks, they were these folks and they were folks like them. Many who uh, were ex-prisoners came out of the jails back into their communities and laid the foundation for what were the later developments that lead us to where we are now. And so I want to begin by expressing my deep appreciation and respect uh, for you and your work and the courage that you expressed in doing. I know some of the courage that was behind some of the things you talked about, and it's quite admirable. I want to also frame, because I have Northern Ireland and generalizable lessons, and you know, generalizable lessons are lots of things. I mean, first off, I mean, every conflict is, is different. Every conflict is like some other conflicts, and so how do you separate those things? What is important about this conflict that is like other conflicts? What is important about this conflict is absolutely different 
from other conflicts and specific to this one and somehow sorting that out is what we kind of academics try to do and so I'm going to make my stab at it. There are a lot of lessons that you could generalize. Some of them you've already heard were explicit and implicit in many of the talks that were already given. The ones I want to talk about are a specific kind and that is in many conflicts uh, you know what the outcome is going to be. You've known it for some time. That's particularly true in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict today that you go and ask anybody, they can tell you exactly what the settlement's going to look like if, it's, if there's going to be a settlement. Now that doesn't mean there's going to be a settlement because uh, people can look at it and say, well, if that's the agreement, I prefer no agreement to that agreement. But oftentimes it's the people like that agreement but can't figure out how to get there. I mean, the Good Friday Agreement is oftentimes called Sunnydale for slow learners and many of the features of the Good Friday Agreement were present there. But the parties couldn't get there at that point even if they wanted to. And so I want to talk some about what is it that prevents people from getting to those kinds of agreements that they want to make, that are in the interest of both parties to make, but somehow they can't do, and how that might be applied, learned it in Northern Ireland, but it might be applied in other situations, and in fact I am applying it in other situations. Bonnie asked us to begin by talking some about how we became involved in, in uh, Northern Ireland. And my involvement became in the early 90s. Uh, there was a Jesuit named Brian Lennon. He showed up at Stanford for reasons that I won't tell you. And, and I got in charge of showing him his group around. They were from Portadown. And as these folks can tell you, whenever you see Portadown in the news, it's not good news. And so he was there, and I showed him around, and somehow or another I liked this guy. And I said, well, my center, which was not actually this center then, it was the Center for International Security and Arms Control, and I was in the ethics program there. I said, my center ought to be able to help you. And he looked right at me and said, well, what, like what? And I looked back at him and said, I haven't a clue. But if we keep talking, we might come up with something. And that began a conversation in 1971 that continues now. And we continue that conversation because it's interesting. And when it's not interesting anymore, we'll become drinking buddies or something. But right now we're in conversation with one another and continue to do so, and that's what we do as a center, is in conversation with one another. In 1997, uh, Brian was over, and we sat down and put our heads together and decided there was going to be an agreement. There was going to be agreement primarily because the two governments involved wanted there to, to be one, so they were going to sit the parties down at the table and say, sit there until you come up with an agreement. Now what we didn't know whether that agreement was going to be six weeks down the line, six months down the line, six years down the line, or 60 years down the line. We didn't have a clue about that. But we also knew that when that agreement was reached, there weren't the relationships on the ground to sustain that agreement. And so Brian went back to, to Northern Ireland and drew together some of the people who were carrying a, a uh, on dialogue across some of the violent interfaces in Northern Ireland and formed a group called Community Dialogue. And at that point I said, well, you know, why don't we put your skilled practitioners against with my researchers and see what we came up with. And so we began a kind of extended conversation that has lasted 10 years. And we structured that conversation around two sets of questions, two questions actually. First question was, if practitioners knew everything that researchers knew, what would they find interesting? And if researchers knew everything that practitioners knew, what would they find interesting? And if we put those two things together, I bet was we'd have something interesting. And you can be the judge of that. We also focused, uh, I want to go back to this just a second, because I like that cartoon. <laughs> That cartoon was an illustration of what we were not going to do. This was not going to be a, a project in which um, there were researchers, professors of barbarian studies, and two barbarians, and we'd follow around and look at them, although there was a great deal of discussion when I would use this in Northern Ireland as to who were the barbarians and who weren't, but uh, I'll leave that discussion aside and, and say that wasn't what we were about. We weren't studying anybody. What we were doing was talking with folks. We basically said, we've got some conceptual analyses, we've got some tools, you've got some experiences we're really interested in, as I explained, let's talk. And if that's interesting to you, we'll continue that conversation as long as it's interesting to you. And so we didn't do any of this studying. I never studied uh, anybody in Northern Ireland. I talked to people in Northern Ireland. I reflected on those uh, 
um, those conversations, but I never studied them in the way social science or political science study uh, someone. We focused our project on, uh, on dialogue and its relationship to political and social reconciliation. And the dialogue that we wanted to focus on was that dialogue that was going on in Northern Ireland. But we meant dialogue very generally. So it could be dialogue that's face to face. It could be dialogue that is in particular groups. It could be just general discourse in the society. It goes on in the media, in the political discussions. But dialogue in a broad sense. What's the relationship of that dialogue to the processes of so political and social reconciliation? And so we first had to decide, well, what in the world are we talking about? And we decided that dialogue had to do with greater understanding. And that reconciliation, for reasons that, that I'm going to skip over, but if you want to go back to it, we defined that as building political partnerships. We didn't think that reconciliation meant that they had to agree. In fact, they didn't have any meaning if they did agree. Uh, but that it had to do with how do you build political partnerships with people who disagree for building a mutually beneficial future. And so that's how we defined uh, reconciliation. When we first started, I, I thought they were really closely connected. I thought we'd get people together, we'd have dialogue. It was going to be dialogue about uh, reconciliation, and we'd just move right ahead. Well, I got disabused of that notion fairly quickly. Because for one thing, if it was a dialogue for people who wanted there to be political and social reconciliation, they were the choir. I mean, they, they, they were already bought on to this. This wasn't hard. Uh, they, were, they were there. They wanted to do it. We'd move ahead with it. The people we wanted in dialogue were people who would sit here and say, I'm not sure that building a partnership's a good idea. I don't really believe that other side. In fact, I want to only come because I want to hear if they can really say the absurd things they say and keep a straight face. And I want to tell them what the truth is. So those were the people that we wanted to, to get into dialogue, not the choir. And we wanted to see whether it had any relationship to this other thing. Now, one of the things about greater understanding is greater understanding can lead to the realization that whatever sense of political partnership I thought was possible, it's much less possible than I thought. And so we had to leave that possibility open, talking about what is open-ended kind of dialogue, whether that dialogue can then help to build the foundations of some sort of political partnership. When I said that we uh, went in there, we brought into this conversation with our partners a certain kind of framework. It's called the barriers framework, and I introduced it when I said what keeps the parties from reaching an agreement that any third party, outside party, could see would leave both parties better off. Well, if it leaves both parties better off, there's no theoretical reason. In fact, there's no practical reason why they not, ought to not take that step, and yet all the time they can't do it. So our analysis was about what stands in the way. I was given a 20-minute talk. If I was given a, a hour talk or a two-day talk, I would tell you some of the kind of barriers and go into that kind of analysis. But let me just say that there are certain kinds of lessons that we learned in that. Some that were more important than we thought, some things that were less important than we thought, some things were just completely different. And I just want to run through them briefly because this is some of the real world uh, lessons that we learned. The importance of intergroup conflict, uh, that oftentimes what's going on within the parties is what makes goes on going on between the parties possible. That, in fact, if there's a change in what's going on between the parties, it's because some change internal to the parties has taken place. That that drives the process as much as the relationship across does. Uh, the importance of relationship and trust, especially in helping each side to deal with would-be spoilers. The futility of trying to convince people what they can't afford to understand. I mean, just you all the time find people that say, I'm going to make you understand this. Well, they're not going to understand because they can't politically, given their future and their commitments, understand what's being said. The importance of tipping points, and I want to say a little bit more about this one because this one I think is really important. And it came from uh, some of your friends, Davey Irvin. Davey Irvin was talking to a group at Stanford, something similar in a room that looks like this, and some bright-eyed Stanford student said, would you please tell me about your conversion from violence to peace? And he wasn't buying it at all. He said, well, it wasn't really that. Uh, I, I, I became a paramilitary on uh, Bloody Friday. Uh, uh, I made a calculation. 
Uh, I had to act. The calculation was 51.49 that I'd become a bomber. But I had to act. I couldn't write. When I act, I was 100% bomber. But the calculation wasn't 100% for this. It was 51.49. Later on, the situations changed, especially when I was in prison. And it tipped the other way. It became 51.49 in favor of being engaged in politics. And I became a 100% politician. So sometimes that shift is just really minor, but it can have dramatic outcomes. The importance of the transparency of loss, I'll say more about that later. The tension between the desire for peace and the demands of justice, I'll say something about that, as well as the corrosive effects of humiliation. I want to make just a few brief points about uh, reconciliation. There's really two senses in which that term is used. The older sense was one in which a person was reconciled to the situation, reconciled to the context. No, 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 no. I got, we didn't start till five after. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, I'm going to be quick then. I'm going to skip this, except to say that one of the things that we did was to, um, that rather than negotiations building peaceful relationships, we think that peaceful relationships make possible for successful uh, negotiations, both the implementation, the post-conflict building, the building of political relationships. So we wanted to focus on what is building peaceful relationships. The, um, we felt that peaceful relationships were built around four questions. Um, the question of a shared future. Are the parties willing to envision a future for the other side? That if the other si that the other that it the other side would find minimally bearable, the question of trustworthiness: How can the parties trust each other to honor their commitments? The question of loss acceptance: How can the party accept the losses that a settlement imposes so that they can make the concessions that it requires? And the question of just entitlements: How can the parties work together to alleviate the most egregious injustices? The most important one is the shared futures question. Are the parties willing to envision a future for the other side that it would find minimally bearable? Now that basically means that when I hear about your dreams and goals and aspirations for yourself, your family, and community, when I see that future emerge, I say, is there a place for me that I could bear, that I could live with? If that future that you're talking about came about, would I find a bearable place in it? I may have to grit my teeth. It may be minimally bearable. But if that future came about, I would live with it, and vice versa. So we say oftentimes that a shared vision of the of a future is not a shared vision of the of the of a future. Shared vision of the future is we agree. Hopefully, politics can bring about a shared vision of the future. What we were concerned about was could you lay a vision of a shared future in which each side saw that there was a place for them in the vision of the future the other side was a seeking. What this does is establish a domain, a political domain. Because politics depends upon my being able to lose and still have a future that I can live with. And so if I know that you can be politically success successful, defeat me, and that future come about, I still have a future there. I have a place that I can live. That allows us to do politics. It also establishes a domain of trust. Because if you think of trust as encapsulated interest, I trust you because I have a cognitive judgment, a perception that my interests are encapsulated in yours in such a way that when you pursue your interest, you'll further mine as well. And that's very close to what we talk about as a vision of a shared future. I'm going to be really brief now. Um, the question of trustworthiness is how can the parties trust each other to honor their commitments? Uh, how can they demonstrate through word and deed that something has changed? Because for all along, up until this point, they said they were going to make, they, they are now going willing to do what they previously <coughs> said they couldn't do, would under no circumstances would do. So why would I trust you? And um, the most important one of these things is agreements that mass disagreements, which is a kind of problems that have to, how do you get from here to there, which is what really this question of trustworthiness is about. Agreements, that, in every agreement that is made, it is an agreement that mass disagreement. So we agree about these, but there are fundamental disagreements that we still disagree about. And so the question is, in many ways, how can you use the things that you agree about to begin to uh, address the things that you still disagree about? 
And that's what I see both the Good Friday Agreement, the St. Andrews Agreement, all of every political agreement, every agreement that the Belfast City Council makes is a political agreement, is an agreement that masks fundamental disagreement. And it then becomes the context in which you try to work those things out. Three observations. Every negotiated agreement imposes losses and injustices on the parties, often unequally. Uh, it's just the nature of a negotiated agreement. You didn't win. You don't get all you want. It's going to impose losses that you don't think are justified. It's going to impose injustices on you that you don't think are justified. It's going to happen that way. That's part of the con and, it's, and they're not, in most hard situations, not equal. If they were equal, that'd be a different thing. That would be easy. In most hard conflicts, they're not imposed equally on the parties. How do you deal with that? There are deep asymmetries which make, which make reciprocity uh, a problem. That's the way human beings deal with things. You trade things of equal value. Uh, most serious conflicts don't have those trades available to the parties. If they did, it'd be easier to, to solve the problem. There's also humiliation, powerlessness, and loss and injustice. Those play factors that are often ignored by academics and, and, and negotiators, and yet they play critical elements in this. It's oftentimes hard to deal directly with humiliation and powerlessness. I can tell you don't be humiliated. I can tell you be, get more power. That doesn't really help you. So we tried to fold those things into questions about loss and injustices. I'm, I'm, I'm hopping along. Uh, the question of loss acceptance. How can the parties accept the losses that a settlement imposes so they can make the concession that it requires? I think this is important. Both sides will feel that the settlement requires real and painful concessions from them and gives them little of significance in return. That the settlement requires no meaningful concession from the other sides and gives them everything is important. And so how do you deal with that? Uh, since basically it's based, based on the fact of I don't think you had any legitimate claims on the things that you're giving up. So that begins the process of making concessions where you feel those are painful concessions that you make to one another. What we think is that each side gains a greater appreciation of the cost that the other side is willing to bear in order to reach an agreement. So if I begin to understand what you've given up in order to live in peace, it makes me more likely to be willing to make those concessions. And that comes through dialogue as well as understanding. Finally, the question of just entitlements. How can the parties work together to alleviate the most grievous injustices? Uh, that's the buzzsaw. Uh, the buzzsaw is that, that, the part, that the agreement has to be minimally just in order to have it any legitimacy, and yet justice is a barrier uh, to the reaching of conflicts. What we do is we don't really think that anybody in an existential sense asks them quest that question, is this a fair agreement? What they ask themselves, we think, is are the injustices that this situation places on me worth bearing for the benefits of the common? And the parties have to make that, that answer be yes, so that the calm is worth enduring the injustices because of the benefits I get. That's the question I think I asked myself at Stanford. It's what the question I think many people ask themselves here. It's what the question the people in the West Bank ask themselves. The answers to that are very different. But we nevertheless think that's the thing. And the way you can deal with it is say, how can we work together to lessen the injustices that the agreement is going to pose on the parties? We have to work together to do that. We can't alleviate it. We're not going to agree about what justice is, but we are going to, we can work to agree with what are the greatest injustice and how can we work together to alleviate them. Um, I'm not going to do that one. And so now I'm going to leave you with the conclusion. Uh, it would be my preference that you think that the Nobel Peace Prize is on the way, it's in the mail, but it's probably more likely you'd say if it made sense, this would be a powerful idea. Ronnie, and do you have a PowerPoint? Uh Okay, so 
I think uh, my presentation will be uh, slightly different from that of uh, Byron, um, happily. Uh, just I think I have a, a bit of a different focus. Uh, why did I become interested in Northern Ireland in the first place? Uh, at first I was, I think, very much in narrow-minded academic mode. Um, and I thought mostly about very abstract conceptual questions, such as the conflict of interest within groups of people who share the same broad political goals. I had in mind something like uh, Kevin and Matt. Um, uh, I also thought about how it was remarkable that a very large movement that used armed force uh, made such a successful, if transformation is an appropriate word to use, uh, transformation from a conflict that most observers uh, almost universally thought was intractable at the time. I was also interested in the fact that in Northern Ireland you saw a variation in the type of non-state groups' use of violence, specifically in the type of targets that they chose, the, their use of brutality, and their organizational structure or tendency to fracture. And then I became quite preoccupied uh, and uh, I might say a bit disillusioned with the problems in the study of conflict and settlement in social science and politically and particularly in political science. Uh, I feel that there's both conceptual uh, flaws and methodological mistakes as we approach some questions in the study of conflict, particularly that of insurgency or terrorism. So with current methods or approaches, uh, we've, I think that scholars have made the most advances in, in areas where they conduct projects, for instance, quantifying traits of suicide bombers. Now, suicide bombing is, constitutes less than 1% of all terrorism in the history of political violence. So this is a very unique category, um, and I don't think that we can easily extrapolate from that what kind of people join groups that use political violence or use force and are politically motivated and then try to infer as well why they may stop or change strategies. More conceptually, uh, the concept of civil war versus civil conflict uh, misses the point uh, of, I think, characterizing how serious a conflict is in the first place, uh, because as you might see from this map, and hopefully it will, uh, the animation will be quick enough, but these are all names of those <coughs> people who were killed during the troubles, and uh, I think that by the approaches that we take, we don't appreciate how personal uh, conflict ends up being uh, to a society that is permeated by uh, tragic and violent human division. So that is something that I've been preoccupied with methodologically and conceptually uh, for some time now. So what did I decide to do? Uh, well, I spun my wheels for probably way too long, and then I finally decided to look at some of the factors that prominent scholars have examined when it comes to the question of civil conflict, and particularly economic opportunities and repression by either a government or proxy forces, uh, at individual and local levels. Basically, I think that we need more personal stories and an understanding of the variation that occurs at individual levels because people join groups for different reasons and people decide to put down the gun for different reasons as well. Uh, and it may be a complex question, but not one that we necessarily cannot answer. So. Uh, I, I wanted to begin to talk to a broad sample of people on all sides of conflict and peacemaking. So then I, uh, I'm moving on to the question of 
the experiences that I've had in Northern Ireland as, as far as it concerns divisions between like-minded people. And I've just uh, listed some quotes here and I think I'll omit uh, reading some of them, but uh, uh, I think maybe the last one might be the most helpful. Um, Jerry Adams, uh, the former IRA leader and president of Sinn Féin, once said, we in Sinn Féin were more the enemy than the British and the Unionists for some of the SDLP leadership. So I think that uh, that was something that interested me a great deal conceptually and that I tried to explore at an individual level with people whom I interviewed. Um, moving on to different types of government repression and the type of impact that that might have on different individuals in different circumstances. Um, I like both of these uh, quotes. Um, I think that there's a great difference between uh, people who experienced the conflict in, in Belfast and the people who experienced the conflict in Derry, or as some might call it London Derry. Uh, I, the first quote says, I got release, released from Long Kesh. Things were pretty bad when I got out. The loyalists were shooting Catholics left and right, left, right, and center, and I lived in a Protestant area and was really vulnerable to attack. Uh, so there was a, much more of a focus in my field work when I spoke with people from Belfast on the problem of feeling that they were being persecuted by their sectarian neighbor. Uh, in on the other hand, um, and in opposition to this, um, Maraid, and I've uh, changed both of these names to preserve an anonymity, a resident of Derry, uh, talked ex extensively about the British Army and the RUC and how they were the best recruiting agents for the IRA. So Derry seemed as if it were much more of a city in which the fight was between the Irish and the British and not necessarily between Catholic and Protestant neighbors that were living in a patchwork. Uh, this is something that I think that uh, Kevin mentioned during, uh, during his presentation, and uh, I think it uh, is terribly important that para paramilitary leadership uh, is able to demonstrate to uh, government negotiators that they have an ability and a willingness to control the rank and file. So for instance, I'll read just the last quote. Um, the most important people to convince that the Good Friday Agreement should be accepted were the activists or the volunteer members of the IRA because they had sacrificed the most and they had moral sway over potential new activists. So uh, and there was also an episode I know where uh, uh, the government was, the British government was contemplating accepting a an offer by the IRA to go on a ceasefire, although I think they did not use that term. And they were quite worried about whether or not the message was uh, both genuine and that uh, the leaders of the IRA would be able to, in fact, carry it out. This is uh, an area that I think, uh, like Byron, I uh, am very much preoccupied with, uh, the question of personal trust. I think that uh, social scientists, and particularly in political science, were not very well equipped to handle this question of what is trust and what does it mean in circumstances of conflict and potential settlement. So uh, I, I think that uh, all three of these quotes uh, are very good illustrations of how important trust is, uh, especially when the stakes are so high. Um, actually, one day I joked with students, and I think I might have scared them, that uh, if they got a question wrong on their paper, what if they had lost a finger for each time they got something wrong? Um, and I think that would make people a lot more careful. Um, and I think just putting yourself in that position for a moment uh, makes you realize that uh, the decisions that we make in life in absence of uh, in the absence of great conflict, um, are much easier to make because they have much less dire consequences, potentially. So one Irish civil servant said, yes, I was chosen to work with a group uh, toward its decommissioning because it was obvious I got on best with them. 
in that group out of everyone. Uh, another, uh, another respondent, a senior Republican activist said, uh, I did not want any document proposing a way forward that is toward peace, uh, change in strategy to, to be attributed to me because if you propose an idea that would not be acceptable, well, and he made a motion of um, a gun or a bullet going into his ear. So in that environment, you, I'm sure one can imagine how important personal trust is. Um, John Chilcott, um, who was working for the Northern Ireland office during the time of the peace process, uh, commented on the need for a Republican ceasefire that was uh, much more extensive than one that was on offer because he said some great gesture was necessary because the leap from Republican politicians from former terrorists was a big gap to judge across. So again, trust, uh, trust was key to, to any change there. So the key preliminary findings that I've come up with so far uh, really focus on local and individual factors being crucial in not only the intensity of violence over time in civil conflicts or insurgencies, but potential settlement or political transformation of armed groups. And the specific local and individual factors of importance that I've identified so far uh, through mostly speaking with people, but then trying to find also some quantitative evidence to support it as well, is that conflict within political communities themselves uh, is important because it, uh, it can either increase or decrease the coherence of a group that is <coughs> negotiating with a, a government, uh, which relates to the, if you skip over the next one, the leadership's ability uh, to control the rank and file and volunteer paramilitary uh, organizations or groups. Uh, this is a, uh, I think, probably the, the foremost concern of any government uh, representative that is negotiating with uh, potential, potentially mainstream uh, groups that are still engaged in the use of force. Uh, different types of government repression in different areas, I think, truly affect uh, the level of animosity that people might have toward a government uh, or toward their view of the enemy and may make, may make them more or less predisposed to sitting down in dialogue. And then again, to reiterate personal trust, especially at moments of uh, potential strategic change because those are moments of extremely high risk and extremely high stakes. So this would just be to uh, briefly illustrate that uh, <coughs> local conditions differed quite a bit, um, even when you examine some of the main factors that predominant scholars tend to look at when they're studying uh, the tendency to engage in violence or uh, to, to settle politically. So although you see that in the Armagh, Belf on the left in red, Armagh, Belfast, and Derry districts um, from 71, 81 to 91, that trends in unemployment were <coughs> similar in these three areas. But at the same time, uh, the trends in the Republican use of force uh, were not similar in those same districts. And this is just, uh, this is preliminary evidence. Also, now this um, I think is something that um, I've been increasingly focusing on is the difference between the experience uh, of people living through the conflict in Belfast versus uh, in Derry. Uh, the blue indicates deaths that, or the percentage of deaths that were caused by British forces and the orange represents uh, deaths, the percentage of deaths caused by loyalists. And you'll see on the left, the left three columns are uh, Belfast uh, from 72 to 81, 82 to 91, and 92 to 2001. And those same years on the right for Derry. And you can see that uh, British forces were much more active and uh, much more deadly in Derry uh, than were loyalists. And the opposite was true in Belfast. 
So uh, just to, to briefly wrap up, um, I've taken a, a preliminary look at violent movement movements elsewhere, um, and particularly in democracies where there is a potential for political participation. Um, and just over 90% of such movements, and this is only from the years 99 to 2002, are either partly or entirely represented by at least one conventional organization, which means uh, this is not trivial. It's, it means that the tr um, potential for political transformation is there, and that also uh, armed opposition movements or armed groups are not monolithic, um, but are rather characterized by greater or lesser degrees of internal division. Finally, what I would say when it comes to understanding what happened um, at the end of the Troubles and perhaps what facilitated agreement was that uh, dialogue and a willingness to just sit down at the beginning uh, was, was crucial in uh, the initial momentum toward the peace agreement. And there's been a, a recent uh, Supreme Court ruling in late June of this year, um, Holder versus the Humanitarian Law Project. And the ruling held that any, quote, material support of a foreign terrorist group, including talking to terrorists or the communication of expert knowledge and scientific information, helps lend legitimacy to the organization. And I think that this is something that hasn't received enough attention. Um, I'm not a legal expert, but I do think that it will uh, hamstring uh, political, civil, and military leaders if they see uh, an opening for dialogue with violent groups um, that may be seeking to give up the use of force. Um, and at the same time, it gives no incentive to such groups to feel that a change to their, non to their strategy or engaging in talks uh, will be worth their while. So I think that this is actually, if we say that the age after uh, September 11th, we're living in a new world and we're fighting a global war on terror, that this is one of the most uh, unfortunate and um, possibly uh, destructive developments to occur uh, depending on how it's implemented in American foreign policy. Um, so that is um, my take on the Good Friday Agreement and its uh, implications for conflicts elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. And now we'll hear from Brendan. Let's do a little change of equipment here. There are two basic ethnic groups. There's the PC group and the Mac group. The PC group refute. <laughs> The PC group is hegemonic <coughs> and monopolistic. <laughs> the MAC group is much more creative, dynamic, <laughs> on the rise, and insists on power sharing. Please don't start, Mr. Chairman. I, I have to deal with the complexities of the monopolistic behavior of um, <laughs> PCs. Okay, we can start. I'm Brendan O'Leary. I'm Irish by origin. I'm a Catholic atheist. It really does matter which God you don't believe in. <laughs> I became a Northern Irish person by coercion. My parents were living in Nigeria and they decided because of the Nigerian Civil War that we would go to Northern Ireland. <laughs> because it was peaceful and they would, they would be certain that I would have a good education. In their naivety, they sent me to Protestant primary schools. That's where I was asked the question by a very liberal headmaster, what's your religion? And I turned to my sister Mary, who was beside me in the queue, and I said in my best English accent, because I'd been brought up with English people, I don't know, Mary, I think we're Roman Catholics. There was a deadly silence in the room. 
and I proceeded to learn the art of armed combat with each <laughs> young male in that very small primary school in a place called Clohy. Later on, my parents sent me to a Catholic boarding school, and the results are before you. So that's my origins. I'm not impartial on this particular subject matter because it deals with my homeland, but in consequence of my involvement in my homeland, I have become what is called an expert on power sharing. I spent the last year um, as the United Nations Senior Advisor on Power Sharing with the Department of Political Affairs Mediation Support Unit of the United Nations. Roughly speaking, the longer a person's title is, the more unimportant they are. <laughs> Nevertheless, I did try to bring to bear on the, the work that I did my experience um, in Northern Ireland and my uh, knowledge of how things have gone there. This is a graphic which I don't know if you can see very well, which introduces um, my first theme on Northern Ireland. Have you ever played the game Trivial Pursuit? Yeah. There's a question in Trivial Pursuit, name a famous Belgian. Can any of you answer that question? Go on. King Leopold. King Leop. Very good. Excellent. Most people answer Tintin, who's a cartoon character, or they answer with the names of Flemish painters from the 17th century before Belgium came into existence. But the person who deserves to be known as a famous Belgian is Victor de Hont. Victor de Hont invented the rule of proportional representation applied in the, uh, the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly. And that particular rule was first used uh, extensively in European politics in the late 19th century and applied to the allocation of committee places in the European Parliament more recently. People in Northern Ireland will tell you that the de Hunt formula is terribly complicated. That's what this graphic suggests. It's not. All you need to do is to understand some basic arithmetic. The very first time the de Hunt rule was used in Northern Ireland, the allocation of seats was uh, organized across the four major political parties in Northern Ireland, the Ulster Unionist Party, the SDLP, the Democratic Unionist Party, and Sinn Féin. The first party gets the largest um, share of the seats, so it gets the first ministry, you divide its seat share through by two, you look for the next largest number, you, divide, you give that party a ministry, you divide its seat share by two, and so on and so forth until you filled all the ministerial positions. What does this do? It enables you to allocate seats in a cabinet proportionately according to party strength without requiring the parties to bargain intimately over who's going to hold each particular post. It therefore suppresses the possibility of parties vetoing one another's uh, potential candidates for ministerial positions. It's an excellent system. It's a Northern Ireland innovation. It deserves to spread elsewhere. What's the advantage of it? It stops the necessity of protracted negotiations over government formation. If there's willingness to have a government, then the allocation simply works mechanically. In Northern Ireland, the system is now used so smoothly that the parties actually met to agree on how the allocation process would go, so there would be, quote unquote, no surprises. That's a remarkable achievement. It's a result of Northern Ireland applying the principles of proportionality developed elsewhere in Europe. Most people are hostile to power sharing. They think it's a bad idea. There are three arguments used against power sharing. One, it's futile. It makes no difference. Second argument, power sharing is perverse. It damages values that we hold to be dear. In particular, people think it entrenches undesirable identities. It produces immobilism and gridlock, highly undesirable, uh, blocked decision making. People also argue that power sharing jeopardizes some of our, um, so I, I, I use the terms wrongly, I'm, I'm sorry. Perversity produces the opposite of what you intend. Um, jeopardy obviously uh, damages uh, pre-existing values. The, the argument of, about jeopardy is that if we have um, power sharing arrangements, we're going to allocate positions on the basis of identity, not on the basis of merit or need, and we're going to endanger the principle of democracy, which is competition, and majority rule. Those are the typical arguments applied against power sharing every, everywhere. You'll be familiar with them in, in the United States as they apply sometimes when we have a situation in which a president confronts a, a, a Congress controlled by another party. What are the arguments for power sharing? One, these three arguments can't be simultaneously right at the same time. Something can't be simultaneously futile, make no difference, and at the same time jeopardize 
profound values and produce perverse consequences. Something has to give. One of those uh, criticisms um, has to go. And it's obviously futility. Power sharing does make a difference. The second objection uh, in favor of power sharing is to suspect those who criticize power sharing. Those who criticize power sharing are insisting that their identity, normally the one that's uh, most dominant, should prevail. The, the most vehement objection to power sharing comes from the uh, locally dominant majority. There are others who advocate against power sharing who claim to have cosmopolitan and transcendent identities. Don't believe them. They're people with passports in their pockets. They're people who have a secure nation state behind them. They are normally uh, the propagators of a dominant uh, group's uh, perspectives and interests. The third argument in favor of power sharing is it's realistic. The option is either power sharing or filling graveyards on behalf of homogenization projects. That's the fundamental claim for power sharing. It's also a claim of power sharing that good fences make good neighbors. As you've heard intimately from uh, this morning's panelists, a lot of Northern Ireland conflict was local uh, and highly intimate. If you have good fences, equal fences, then there are some prospects that there will be sufficient security that neighbors can get along with one another. If you try and compel neighbors to be identical to one another, to integrate them forcibly or to assimilate them, you will generate conflict. By contrast, power sharing creates the possibility of sufficient security to generate some degree of pluralist coexistence. Positively, you can argue for power sharing on the grounds that it combines the possibility of justice with the principle of proportionality. And arguably, it provides a much better model of democracy. Under majority rule, the majority never rule. Under majority rule, a plurality which controls the dominant party and which controls uh, the, the faction which controls the cabinet controls the, the entire society. And that's usually a very small elite of the whole society, by no means representative of the median voter. By contrast, when you have power sharing, that obliges at least some power sharing between rival leaders who represent different blocks of the electorate. And in fact, proportional representation, because it guarantees that the government that, that is formed has an overall majority in the legislature, is much more likely to generate genuine majority rule than so-called majority rule systems. So that's the rhetoric. Let's talk about um, things beyond the rhetoric. If we um, think about democracy conventionally, we contrast it with dictatorship. At the very end, I'm sorry for the, the poor lighting. Is it possible to uh, adjust the lighting so that people can have some prospect of seeing this, these graphics? Um, I can't change the resolution. I'm not that technically competent. I'm a professor. <laughs> get a right. PC. OK. Get a PC. <laughs> see, the, see the problem? Um, I, I'll, I'll skip these because they, they depend importantly on, on seeing the visuals, and it isn't going to work. Um, I can adapt. It's OK. Just let me tap my way through this. Um, if we look at the Northern Ireland conflict since the peace process began, there's been a dramatic transformation of party fortunes. The moderate parties, the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP, have lost their way. They have been superseded in their respective communities by Sinn Féin and the DUP. In one sense, this is a remarkable <coughs> transformation which most people don't notice. Northern Ireland is the only place in Western Europe governed by working class parties. Matt is depressed. Kevin is depressed. This is the only place in Western Europe with serious socialists in power. Working class parties in favor of large scale public expenditure, hostile to the market, in favor of public subsidies, uh, the entrenchment and protection of the welfare state, looking after the poor, comprehensive education, etc. It's the only place in Western Europe where working class parties are in power and middle class parties are a minority. Remarkable. But that's not what I want to talk about. Instead, what I want to talk about is the remarkable phenomenon of hardline parties defeating moderate parties in the course of a peace process. Why did it happen? Some people say that it happened because uh, power sharing rewards the extreme. And therefore, the Northern Ireland uh, process is an undesirable uh, international lesson that power sharing entrenches extremists and uh, gives uh, unnecessary sway to hardliners. 
If you look at what happened in Northern Ireland, however, in detail, that's not an accurate representation of what occurred. What occurred was that Sinn Féin and the DUP both moderated their political platforms and in consequence became more in tune with broader sections of their potential electorate than they had previously been. In addition, the respective publics began to consider voting for them, and I demonstrate this in the circulated paper, not because the respective publics were becoming more extreme, but because they realized that they respectively needed champions of their communities to effectively negotiate for them. If you're a unionist, you don't want Roy Garland to negotiate on your behalf. Roy Garland's a Quaker. He's a really nice guy. He's not going to be a good champion for you in the negotiations. He'll give in too easily. He'll be sweet and kind and reasonable. <laughs> you want Ian Paisley. He's a Quaker. A Quaker's the nearest thing to a Protestant atheist that, that, that actually exists conceptually. Right? That's what I, a Quaker is somebody who's actually an atheist but doesn't know it. Um, <laughs> so the point in the paper is to emphasize that a power-sharing system in Northern Ireland, and this uh, is, a, is a generalizable lesson, can work very well if people know that they're voting for hardliners as their respective champions in a power-sharing system, and additionally know that those champions are not about to collapse the system and destroy it because they've been modified. They have credibility as hardliners because of their previous records of intransigence, but they also have credibility as future players because they've promised not to wreck the system. So the Northern Ireland story is a remarkable one, the SDLP and the Ulster Unionist Party have lost sway to, to the hard, harder line parties, but those hard line parties have been successful because they're less hard line and now portray themselves as the champions of their respective communities. Is this a general lesson? Is it a mistake for moderates to make deals and create power sharing systems? Will they inevitably lose power in consequence? Is the inclusion of hardliners necessarily going to lead to the extinction or weakening of moderates? Not necessarily. The SDLP and the Ulster Unionist Party had lots of strategic opportunities from 1994 to 2007 to strengthen their positions. And I would argue, we could go through it in some detail, that each of those parties made uh, very serious strategic mistakes which led to the erosion of their respective electoral bases. The um, simple Northern Ireland lessons, therefore, that I'd like to extract before moving to the wider world are, number one, including hardliners is sometimes much better than building power sharing around moderates. Moderates are nice people. You don't need them. You need the hardliners to make power sharing, power sharing work. If you focus on moderates, the moderates you should focus on are the moderates among the hardliners. And you have to realize that if they are to be successful, they need to retain credibility with their own uh, within their own constitu constituencies and their organizations have to be kept as disciplined as possible while uh, successful negotiations are proceeding. If you're involved in negotiations, you should not prematurely uh, try and simplify things. You've got to focus on what the agents say ca they care about and build agreements around the content of those declared demands and preferences. If we briefly note the successes of mediation in Northern Ireland, George Mitchell has been referred to. George Mitchell is a, a man of infinite patience, high, high uh, IQ, significant judicial skills, all very important. But the most important thing was that he was an American. He represented American power. And without the presence of America in the background, the Northern Ireland peace process would not have been so successful. What about power sharing outside of Northern Ireland? Does it matter? Does it work? Let me give you three very brief summaries of recent large-scale academic works which prove the merit, merits of power sharing. The first is by Arendt Leipart, the author of Consociational Theory. He shows, systematically comparing the major democracies of the last uh, 30 years, that in every case, consensual democracies which apply power sharing practices outperform majority rule democracies not only in terms of respect for human rights and soft uh, subjects such as the protection of women's rights and welfare rights for the poor, but also on hard-nosed subjects like economic employment, growth, uh, and uh, general improvement in living standards. Power sharing is not uh, a route to poor economic performance. To the contrary, it actually will improve it. 
Secondly, Pippa Norris has investigated all regimes over the world over the last uh, 30 years, at least since the 1970s. And she shows that the more regimes have three particular attributes, proportional representation uh, election institutions, parliamentary institutions, and federal or decentralized institutions, then they will have better performances than regimes which have less of these attributes. And this is whether or not the regime is formally uh, autocratic or democratic. Basically, the more you uh, have something like power-sharing institutions, then the better your overall governmental performance across the planet as a whole. Michaela Mate, Mattis, and Bruce Savin have recently demonstrated that power sharing after civil wars enhances the prospects that you will not go back to a civil war, provided certain conditions are met. You either require proportionality or parity provisions in political settlements. Proportionality ones are obvious, parity ones less so. That's where you give groups equality, even if uh, they are disproportionate in size. So in Northern Ireland, you have two first ministers, one uh, called a deputy, but he's identical in power and capacity, um, even though the two communities are not identical in size. What these two authors show is that if you have parity and proportionality provisions in conjunction with sensible novel security arrangements, either new integrated security forces or parallel federal or decentralized and autonomous uh, policing arrangements, then you can have a higher likelihood of no return to war. In short, the international evidence confirms what is true of Northern Ireland in particular, that power sharing is a better way of organizing democracy, that it's actually better at hard performance uh, criteria of assessment, uh, both from the point of view of security and human rights provisions and from the point of view of uh, economic performance. So my response to hearing my, my fellow panelists from Northern Ireland was, I didn't understand why they were so depressed about the comparative performance of Northern Ireland's institutions. If we compare them to what life was like before, there's been radical success in the reduction of violence. There's much broader consensus on, on the running of institutions. The government, governmental um, ministers who are in power have relatively, uh, uh, relatively deep public support in terms of mandates. That, of course, has fallen a little bit in the case of the DUP because of uh, corruption allegations. But by comparison with some governments in Western Europe, they've enjoyed higher turnouts and higher levels of support than elsewhere. Northern Ireland is not a fabulous utopian paradise, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was, and it's remarkable in comparative terms. It's easier to understand that, I think, if you're outside of the country than, than if you're inside it. Okay. Um, I have lots more to tell you, but my time has run out, so instead I'll give you the opportunity to interrogate me according to the best liberal democratic practices that are currently available. You might be able to read the slide. Thank you. Okay, so we'll do uh, 10 minutes of Q&A for this panel, then we'll bring the other panelists up here so that we have everybody for a final wrap-up. Um, do we have questions for the panelists? I'm sure there are. Yes, can you wait for the microphone to come to you? Where is the microphone? Yeah, we have uh, runners with microphones. They're there. There we go. Uh, not so much a question as a couple of observations. Uh, one, uh, both Matt and Bonnie referred to the recent Supreme Court decision and uh, the movement to uh, uh, movement against what's called uh, material support of terrorism. Uh, as having to do with 9-11 and with uh, the current, uh, uh, and with America's current situation post 9-11. That's not true. Uh, material support for terrorism in law goes back to the, what was called the uh, Omnibus uh, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1997. That's where it first became U.S. federal law. Uh, proposals for the so-called material support of terrorism, uh, among other, uh, among other so-called anti-terrorist law, go back to the mid-1980s, and were proposed uh, before, and uh, legislation was introduced uh, in front of Congress uh, 
uh, every session up till it was finally passed with the support of the Clinton administration in 1997. That's ironic because uh, uh, because of Clinton's role in the peace and the Irish pre peace process, and because that provision would have prevented the private American initiatives such as the New York Council on Foreign Relations inviting Jerry Adams from happening. Uh, to back up a little bit, material support, what constitutes material support, uh, as Bonnie said, is virtually undefined in the law. It's defined so broadly as in the Supreme Court decision, it could, uh, it could encompass absolutely anything. And what constitutes a terrorist organization is to be decided by the initial, initially in the law by the administration that has devolved to the State Department, which puts together a terrorist organization list. In the law, there is no, uh, there are, uh, there is uh, uh, no provisions governing what constitutes a terrorist law, or what constitutes a terrorist organization or terrorist activities meaning that effectively a uh, terrorist organization is one that's uh, uh, unfriendly to American foreign policy uh, uh, considerations or is so considered. So that is a very dangerous law. It is law. Uh, I'm glad that was brought up in front of a law school group and uh, I don't know what can be done about it given uh, that it's, uh, it's generally accepted now, but it, it's dangerous and uh, will, and will certainly be used against dissent and against uh, uh, against develop against America playing a role as it did in Northern Ireland with uh, other insurgencies around the world. Does anybody want to comment on that? I, I'd like to comment on the the repercussions within the United Nations. There is genuine fear within the United Nations that the potential roles of mediators, those who interact with rebel organizations, for example, might have uh, serious problems uh, with respect to the United States in future. So, for example, I've recently been involved in the Darfur peace process in Qatar, in uh, the, the city of Doha. UN personnel were deployed to assist the rebel organizations in Darfur in uh, their basically building up their negotiating capacities, giving them knowledge of constitutions, human rights procedures, electoral systems, and so on. Is that kind of work now going to be construed as support for terrorist organizations? It would be grossly unfortunate if that were to be the case. I believe one of the Darfur groups is categorized as a terrorist organization by the State Department. 9-11 uh, was a justification for material support. It's not the reason. Let's go to another question. Uh, how confident are any of you that a particular conflict uh, resolutions model can be applied uh, across uh, disputes to unique fact scenarios? And secondly, was there a particular model uh, that had been applied before that was used for the uh, uh, Good Friday Agreement? The standard kind of conflict negotiation resolution model is the is principle uh, principle negotiation, interest based negotiation. You you find it popularized in the getting to yes uh, uh, pamphlet that Roger Fisher, where you identify your interests, you combine interests. Uh, you can't combine co uh, positions in the same way that you can combine interests, and that leads to people making exchanges based on uh, my giving you things that I care about less but you care about more and you giving me things that you care about more that I care about, you care about less and I care about more. That's the kind of basic exchange. And you basically want that exchange to take place. The work at our center has been why does getting to yes not get to yes? So what is it in situations where you want that kind of exchange to take place but it doesn't take place? Well, what prevents the parties from engaging in that? And I, I think that uh, one kind of, of approach in a broader sense is to, is to begin to look at uh, what are the factors that prevent parties from uh, entering that kind of exchange of interest. And I'm not quite sure that that answered your question, but maybe did it? Brenda, do you want to try yes, I, I, broadly speaking, I, I think there are, there are two families of 
power sharing as fully fully fledged systems. One set of families is is territorial. Those are confederal, federal, uh, and autonomy arrangements. These work fine for groups that are dominant majorities in the territories in, in which they live. They work much less successfully for highly mixed areas like Northern Ireland. The second family of models are broadly called consociational. They involve um, power sharing within an executive and a legislature. They involve proportionality. They involve autonomy for groups in matters of self-government like religion and language. And they involve veto rights. You can think uh, when you're going into any particular conflict site about which of these family of models is, is most appropriate. Um, the third uh, way in which power sharing is now frequently thought of is uh, an unfortunate one. It's, it's being used as a way of resolving election difficulties when an incumbent president basically loses power, fraudulently steals the election. The international community comes and says, ah, why don't you have a power sharing arrangement with the loser? Uh, that's, in my view, a form of pseudo power sharing that regrettably is being encouraged internationally as a way of uh, trying to inhibit outbreaks of conflict in certain countries. Much better, in my view, in those cases, simply to uphold uh, electoral standards and fair democratic procedures rather than to uh, reward incumbents who steal uh, elections. We have time for one last question for the panel. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, to summarize, uh, for the future of the Good Friday Agreement and the resolution of problems that were kind of put on hold during the signing of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, uh, one is fair hiring, and the other one is the investi investigation of sectarian murders, uh, particularly those of Pat Finucan and Rosemary Nelson, who were defense attorneys that were systematically assassinated after government employees got on TV and said that. Uh, the problem wasn't just the paramilitaries and the terrorist groups in Ireland, it was the lawyers who were defending them. Uh, of course, this is in a semi-judicial form here, but uh, those were basically put aside. Now, recently, the British government did come out saying, um, and they, they did, a, after $290 million in 40 years, admitted that what happened on Bloody Sunday uh, was entirely the fault of the soldiers and the British government. Uh, immediately, several members of the House of Lords have come forward and say that to have a real conflict resolution work, you have to take things like this and the investigation of sectarian murders, and you have to put them aside. And I'm really just asking the panel what they think about those things, because we're talking about um, a healing process that uh, some people think is now stagnated. Uh, the same issue arises with fair hiring. The European Court of Human Rights, the British government, the Irish government, all acknowledged and accepted that Catholics were being systematically discriminated against, not only in the public and private sector. And w that was pretty much put on hold by the uh, Clinton administration because they said that if you can put down the arms and stop fighting in Northern Ireland, that that's a great place for investment and for the future, and that everyone is going to benefit. So I'm just wondering, as experts on this, because uh, I'm not really sure myself, I'd like to hear what you think about the future of what were, were considered by Americans, particularly very important issues that were put aside and whether they can play a role in the future of a continuing peace in Ireland. Who wants to take that on? I, I don't think fair employment was put aside. Um, as a result of the successful mobilization of Irish Americans, the Fair Employment Act was passed in 1989 by a conservative government, and it was one of the most effective affirmative action um, pieces of legislation in UK history. It's subsequently uh, been strengthened in, in various ways, and it still applies uh, within Northern Ireland, and the, um, the commissions established by the agreement in those domains are, are working effectively, much less effectively than the Human Rights Commission, uh, which is another story which I, I won't go into here. The second um, subject to which you referred uh, was, is, is the question of what to do after a conflict in terms of justice. Um, people have a, a wide range of views on this subject. I, I have a very simple one. If, if people win, if they overthrow an unjust regime, they're able to mete out justice to that regime. If, by contrast, there is no victor, then you won't get comprehensive justice. You might, luckily, if you're lucky, you might get truth. 
Uh, usually you'll get um, a, a little bit of both, but not the full package. And there's a very interesting question. If the state were to um, grant amnesties to all of the public officials who behave wrongly, including uh, those who colluded with loyalist paramilitaries, those who um, perhaps were involved in um, assassination attempts on legal counsel and so on, um, it would also have to um, thoroughly engage in amnesties for, for everybody else. And regrettably, there has not been, in my view, and it wasn't handled at the time of the agreement, a generalized amnesty program. There was something like it. Roughly speaking, the model is, provided you don't return to violence, then uh, there is an effective amnesty. But, but not everything has been done satisfactorily to ensure the future employment of everybody who was, who was held um, either for actual offenses or for alleged offenses uh, throughout the period of the conflict. I was going to add something, but I basically agree with you. Okay, Name well, that. Uh -huh. it's a good place to end that. We're not going to end this session, though. We have a 15-minute wrap-up, and we don't have a break. So if you'll just bear with us for about 30 seconds, we'll bring some more chairs in. And what we're going to be doing in this wrap-up panel is um, each panelist will have two minutes for final comments, and I hope they will address uh, a couple of issues, including what do they think is the greatest obstacle to lasting peace in Northern Ireland going forward, and what do they consider the most important lesson of all the lessons we've been talking about um, from the Good Friday peace process as related to achieving peace elsewhere in the world, for example, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Sudan, Gaza, the West Bank. So um, you want do you want everybody up here? Is that the idea? OK, yes, if you'll just move up. We have one uh, portable microphone, and we'll just go down the line. Why don't we begin with um, Matt here? Uh, you, just whatever you want to say as your final two minutes, but uh, I suggested you might want to think about talking about um, the obstacles to the lasting peace in Northern Ireland or the most important lessons from the Good Friday. Uh, let me uh, <laughs> re respond to Brandon just a second here. That's fine, too. Uh, Brandon misconstrued my fearfulness for depression. <laughs> I'm not depressed. <laughs> Uh, actually, the fear that I have, uh, and I'm, I'm not being uh, negative in, with regards to the issues, my, my fear actually revolves around the dissipation of energy and that things may stall. I think dynamism is important to keep things rolling, keep things moving forward. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, it's going to be really more important as time goes by that we, uh, all the parties remain focused and what the process is actually about. And, you know, this sounds corny, uh, but, you know, uh, peace is not simply the absence of war. And whoever coined that phrase is actually very, very right. Uh, we've, we've got to be about the business of creating that transparent democracy and maintaining that transparent democracy that's going to be critical to the maintenance of peace. And actually, and, and this stems from Brendan's lecture as well, to the maintenance of prosperity. Kevin, your final thoughts? Um, just been throwing a curveball because I didn't expect this one. But um, no, again, I, I think I'd like to just to say to Brendan that I wasn't aware that I was depressed or <laughs> hopefully I, I wasn't depressing everybody else. Uh, I suppose I would call it maybe, uh, maybe more uh, of a facing of reality and a dealing with maybe with a certain amount of disillusion. I'm certainly not depressed because we've come a long way from where we were. Uh, I think I was just counseling against taking it as an end result and thinking that we're now there. Um, I think in all peace process, you're, th there probably is no such place as there. You're just where you are at any given moment, but it doesn't, as Matt says, there has to be a, a continual dynamism. I, th I don't think it ever stops. Um, as far as the uh, moderate parties are concerned, to a certain extent, as, as a former member of the SDLP, I, I would, I, I'm certainly not depressed for the SDLP, because it seems to me the SDLP can maybe hold its hands up to being one of the most successful political parties that has ever existed. Because by and large, it has now achieved all its aims. And to a certain extent, I think the difficulty with the SDLP is that it has rendered itself largely redundant. Um, but the pursuit of prosperity for the whole community is at the heart of uh, the survival of the peace process. 
And I suppose if there's any elements of depression in my views at the moment, it's possibly because uh, of the economic environment that has overcome the whole of Ireland and possibly the whole of Europe and possibly even the United States as well. Uh, that at a time when we now do need uh, more and more investment in the uh, agreement, uh, there was never as little money to invest in it. So I suppose that's maybe one of the fears that I have. But um, no, other than that, uh, I, th I think that the uh, agreement we have stands as a, a shining success. And if there's one thing I would like to see maybe uh, worked upon is the, uh, uh, if it's possible to be done in any uh, country, is the lessening of the grip of the uh, senior civil service and the levers of power. Brenna? Thank you very much. I did not Im mean to imply that my two colleagues were psychologically depressed. <laughs> <laughs> it merely that they sounded politically depressed. And uh, I agree entirely with them that the major question facing both parts of Ireland and indeed Great Britain is the economic maelstrom. And uh, I, I absolutely think that it's <coughs> essential for Irish nationalists to develop a coherent and an alternative economic policy uh, to the nostrums that they're particularly uh, following in the moment south. And um, I think Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin needs to have grown up economics. Um, Northern Ireland is a very, very strange place economically. It looks like a part of Eastern Europe. Uh, very heavy uh, public sector, very old industries. Um, it has lots of talented people. It has the ability to transit to a service-based economy, but it's not as competitive internationally as, as the Republic. And there are tensions between, um, within Sinn Féin between its economic platform in the South and its economic platform in the North, which heavily depends upon uh, cooperation with the, with the British government. Those things have to be ironed out. They have to be fundamental. I'm optimistic in a very strange way. I never thought that the Northern Ireland conflict was fundamentally economic. There were economic injustices. The fundamental conflict was between rival national communities rooted in a colonial heritage. I believe that the key political questions attached to that colonial conflict have been fundamentally resolved. I think that common misery creates possibilities for uh, political co coalitions that might transcend uh, the historic boundaries. Let's hope so. Thank you. Roy, your final thoughts. <coughs> well, um, it's difficult, but the, the greatest obstacle, I think, actually is within the unionist community, that there's no clear leadership or vision for the future. That sounds like a bit of a, a sort of moderate thing I might say, but, but really, the, um, actually, y yesterday, I think it was uh, Peter Robertson and Mark McGuinness who were granted a peace prize, believe it or not, from uh, Glen Cree. But, the, the, well, of course, there's problems with Peter Robertson, but uh, even the, in particular the Ulster Unionists, don't know where they're going, haven't got a clear message, and uh, the DUP also are pretending to, to hold on to their, uh, I suppose it's part of the power sharing, hold on to their hardline support, so they're, they're not really giving the message that there's actually something positive in this. Actually, David Trimble sold the agreement in a negative way by saying, this will put Sinn Féin on the back foot. This is tying them up in a British system and so on. So there was no vision. I, I think actually there is a vision in this. I think it's a better society for everyone and it could be sold. Uh, so that's the greatest obstacle, the lack of uh, vision. On the, on the nationalist part, I suppose uh, they have a, actually, Martin McGuinness is playing quite a, a blinder in a sense that he's getting support, I mean, unbelievably from unionists because he is actually, he is supporting the peace process and, and he's coming across as a decent guy. He's one of the nice guys uh, and he really is. And in terms of the, the lesson, I suppose the lesson is, I mean, Northern Ireland was an intractable dispute. It's, it's incredible that the changes, of, in my view, having been brought up in it, that it actually changed and we've got this far. That is incredible. This, this goes back, uh, you might say, to, well, the, the present conflict of the early 60s or 50s or whatever, but I mean, it goes back beyond that. I was brought up with the stories of the 20s and it goes beyond that. It goes back and back in some people say 800 years. My family came over here, up there, over to Ireland 800 years ago. And there's been conflict one way or another ever since. But in those days, they were old English, loyal to the English king and to the Pope, Catholic and loyalist. Interesting, there's still a few people like that. But uh, that is the, the, the biggest lesson that all problems can be solved with difficulties, because we're, we're still in difficulties and we could still end up in 
for the difficulties, but I'm very optimistic about the future, and I think it's a wonderful experience to live in Northern Ireland uh, when you have that freedom to mix with all sides. I think it's Pani, let's skip to Byron so that you can have the final word. Well, let me say a word for about political depression. Uh, <laughs> I think it gets a bad rap here. I mean, I, I actually never met anyone in Northern Ireland who wasn't for peace. And quite often their vision of peace didn't include the other side in any significant way. But all of them were fighting for peace in some way or another and had a vision of what that peace entailed. And it always entailed their highest ideals, complete justice, safety, security, nonviolence, as they conceived of it. So everyone was fighting for that particular notion. That, that, that can I say, but that was not true of the group I was involved in. Yeah. They said there is no possibility of peaceful coexistence, and we're not going to try to get it. It's, it's betrayal. Uh, so there were some, a minority of identity, but some did not want peace, except through victory. Well, that, well, but that's my point. It was, yeah. it was, they wanted a peace, but it was a victorious peace. This was one that they would, so I don't, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you at, at that particular point. But that a real peace, one that you're actually going to live, is going to pale in comparison to those ideals. And so people feeling disgruntled, uh, sullen, is, is okay by me. Uh, what my goal is not uh, a just peace, but it's a non-humiliating peace. And I think that the real uh, pitfall uh, that people may face with occurs when people begin to experience that peace as humiliating. Uh, I think when I, I got a little rushed in my presentation, but basically you have to have people make the calculation that I'm better off in peace than I was in conflict. And that, that doesn't translate into economic reality. I mean, it's much broader than that, but, in, but economic prosperity is a big part of that. And I, I think that the pitfall that, that may be ahead is when if people somehow through a combination of relationships of stumbling into something of economic downturn begin to experience that piece as humiliating, in which case I think we're in serious trouble. And Bonnie, let me ask you, um, you can say whatever you want in your final comments, but if you would also uh, tell us whether you felt that the panels we've had today have met the objectives that you set out for this project. Uh, I think they've, they've more, than, more than met the objective. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, everybody was able to have such uh, open conversation without animosity and um, discussing quite quite a serious subject, being thoughtful about it, and uh, there were so many different points of views that um, that I, I wasn't actually expecting that um, from the academic side as well. So, and I, and I think that there was some nice overlap between some of what these the so-called actors and the so-called academics have, have had to say. Um, so, of course, yes, it's, it's more than my, my expectations. It's kind of like nerd fantasy football, I guess. <laughs> um, but um, so I, I guess in closing, I would say um, I, I'm, I might be biased, but I think the, the greatest obstacle may be education. Uh, young people really need to <coughs> know what happened. Uh, and uh, if they don't know what happened, they can't avoid the mistakes of the past. Um, and I think, well, I, I suppose I could end on a note that may be a bit lighter. I, I was convinced after I had spoken to a number of people of, about what um, had finally convinced all of the parties to sit down and maybe come up with a some sort of deal, and I had I'd been convinced by the time that I got back to the U.S. that it was um, a lot of alcohol and castles with <laughs> good catering. So that's what I, I thought saved the, the peace process, just at least for a month. Um, but no, I think um, I, I actually think that there are great lessons that can be taken from uh, the the history of the conflict and the peace process in Northern Ireland, if not only the idea that there is uh, hope for other con conflicts that we, that we don't believe can be solved. Great. On behalf of my colleague, Calvin Sharp, the dean who you met this morning, Nancy Pratt and her team, 
We want to uh, thank you, the audience, who have been with us this morning through this process, and the speakers, Kevin, Roy, Matt, Bonnie, Byron, and Brandon. Thank you very much.